illustration in everything from print, board games, video games, movies. Uh, I have left no stone unturned at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, I'm making art these days. I'm trying to put it out in the world more. Um, doing a lot of freelance and uh, yeah, working on YouTube now, which you're familiar with and putting out yes. some more art education stuff as well. Yeah. And um, that's nice. Um, I'm actually really happy that you started that YouTube thing because I remember back then when you went to Art Center, um, I think Ahmed uh, showed something or it was a little bit later, but um, Uh, he showed some artwork and I was really a fan of your work there and but you were a little bit like low-key like social media wise um, and I think then you started like doing uh, YouTube mm -hmm. and I was really happy to see all the videos like every time you sketch something I want to draw and sketch oh. my sketchbook um, yes but that's it tell me but tell me why are you so good at anatomy <laughs> why um, all right yeah so I want a secret <laughs> First, fascinated by it, right? That's definitely the number one secret. Um, I just, uh, I always loved it. Probably from like my influences from a kid, um, as a kid. I don't know if you watched, uh, I don't know if you watched Dragon Ball Z when you were- Of course. Kind of yeah, so that really, uh, that really aligned with every part of my young soul. And uh, I just, the, the vigor and the aggression of like just, And the anatomy in Dragon Ball Z is like so off, you know, but it was just like, <laughs> yeah, it was like so exciting. It. <laughs> it was so exciting. And uh, I just fell in love with it. And then that really, you know, I was a kid. I mean, I was like mm. eight or something like that when I really got hooked on that stuff. And um, it, uh, it, it made me want to just like draw figures, powerful figures in, uh, you know, pretty dynamic situations. And then pretty quickly that, you know, it wasn't long before I realized, okay, so you need to like understand the body a bit to be able to do that. And then that just developed very early on into a fascination with anatomy. So definitely the fascination is the first one. And then the second part is good instruction. I had very good instruction for anatomy. Um, I, uh, Who was the instructor? I, so my main, uh, like my main teacher for anatomy was Ray Bustos, who is a, an anatomical master. He's got, you can find his stuff online now. He's got courses with um, New Masters Academy. Uh, mm -hmm. in the, I think the Nomon Workshop has some of his stuff. Um, but uh, he's a big anatomy teacher. He's based in Los Angeles. But uh, he taught uh, a variety of anatomy classes at Art Center, where I went to college, mm -hmm. Pasadena, California. And he's just a great instructor. instructor. He knows everything about anatomy, like not just the stuff that's relevant for drawing. He's like a true anatomist. And um, I took two of his classes as a student. And then I TA'd, I was his teacher's assistant for uh, a long time there. And in that, in that time, I retook both of those classes as the TA. And I like, you know, always sat through the lecture and did the in-class exercises. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then one of them I took several, I was the TA for several more times. So a lot so, of experience. So, so you basically draw, started drawing as a kid, really, like in a pretty young age. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, and, uh, and and how did you decide to study at Art Center? Like, um, That's an interesting question. Um, When I was in like high school, um, mm. I knew I really, I knew that I wanted to focus on drawing, right? So uh, in, in high school here in New York, when I would tell people like, oh, you know, I like art and I think I want to do art as a career, there was like, all right, graphic design or something like that. So the classic mm. like low hanging fruit. And um, I, it was very clear to me early on, you know, like graphic design is easy or something, you know what I mean? But yeah. uh, <laughs> most people here, you're going to do art. People always ask, are you a graphic designer, right? Mm. Uh, um, so when I looked into that, I was like, you do very little drawing of the kind that I'm interested in. So then people would, um, so then there was a few teachers who I'd go to and I'd be like, no, no, I want to like draw like figures, like people. And, uh, you know, No, no one ever told me to like be a fine artist or anything like that. They were, they yeah. were like, be a comic book artist. You should try to be a comic book artist. And then that was my main interest for a while in high school. And then near the end of high school, um, I saw a, what movie? I saw Revenge of the Sith, the third Star Wars prequel movie. 
And mm -hmm. in the credits for that movie, like right after George Lucas's name, Ryan Church's name comes up, billed as the concept design supervisor, something like that. And yeah. I, remember, I remember sitting in the movie theater and being like, what could that mean? And why would that be right after the director's name? So I went home and I Googled him and I looked at his work and the work of other people in his circle, like uh, Dylan Cole and Nick Pugh, like all that, all those like around that time, this is like 08, 07, something like that. That was really like mm -hmm. the big concept art scene. Um, I started looking at their circle and I saw that they did all sorts of stuff. There was figures, there was environments and it was all imaginative and crazy. And I realized like, oh, this, this is the avenue where you can, if you're someone who at the time, like me, I felt like I want to be able to just draw everything, right? Like what I really love is drawing and I want to be able to yeah. understand it super well and do it well. That more than anything, more than comic book art, which had a very definitive look, you know, mm -hmm. more than a, more than graphic design, anything like that, it seemed like that field was wide open. Like it really, you could really do everything and it could look like a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of just got obsessed with it right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I saw that all those people basically came from Art Center. And uh, I was, you know, 17 or 18 at the time. So I was like, all right, I guess that's where I have to go. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, but it's, it's, it's the classic Google search into like journey, life journey, and then industry. And um, can you tell the me and me also and the audience um, a little bit like how was it actually for you to study at Art Center? And how would you say like, where did you learn the most? Oh, okay. Um, Art Center was at least when I was going there. Um, and it has this reputation, but I think it's changed a bit since then. Uh, was very boot campy. It mm -hmm. felt like, um, which I don't, I, I don't align with that so much. I, I, I don't know if I'm all about that. When I was young, you know, I was there at 20 years old. So I was like, you know, I, I had, had a lot of uh, gumption and I felt like I had something to prove. So I felt like I aligned with it more back then. Yeah. Um, but it was very boot campy. It was very like, you got to be good. It's clear how to be good. Um, this is what you do to be good. Uh, if you don't, that list of things that you need to do to be good, if you don't do those things and you're not good at them, you're not going to be good. You know, this is not going to work out for you. And uh, it just had a very like, you know, like a very, I, I don't know how else to put it, but boot camp, you know, it was very mm -hmm. competitive. Some of the teachers were like borderline cruel, you know, when I was like, <laughs> I was building my portfolio in a night classes right before going in. Like I had like a one-on-one -on -one with one of my instructors once where I like yeah. showed him where, what I was going to like apply with. Right. And he like looked through my book. It was like outside in the dark, uh, like under the lights of the parking lot. He's like flipping through my book and he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he closed the book and he was like, all right, look, um, you don't have it this isn't going to work out for you. And I don't mean art center. Like you will never be an artist. You just don't, you don't make any, you don't, <laughs> you don't have an interesting mind. It's just never. You, right? you, you don't know, have an interesting mind. He said mind. that in so many words, right? He was basically <laughs> telling me like, it's not the work. You don't have the necessary spark to be an artist. Right. And he was like, so, you know, you should finish class and all that, but look, man, this is not, this is not going to go great for you. And, you know, if you have, if you want any hope of it going great, you got to like do something completely different. So he didn't tell me like, he didn't give me like good advice. Like, all right, the work's not really good right now. Here's what you could change. He was just like, screw you, you know? And um, that was definitely, that was definitely not characteristic of my whole time at art center, but that was um, it. That was maybe part of like the old school vibe that it had, which I do think it has moved away from. And by the time I was in program, um, It, that had definitely softened you. Yeah, I never got anything that harsh again, mm. but uh, there were some harsh moments for sure. But I mean, it's interesting that you said that because I mean, he basically shattered you and told you you're nothing. Yeah. Uh, here's here's the rope. Hang yourself, basically. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and but you still you didn't give up. So what did you? What made you going through that? Was it a dream? Was it a The, I don't know, to prove him that it's not the case? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't to prove to him. I mm. think just me, myself as a person, always, um, always for my personality and my temperament, um, 
I've never been convinced that one person has the answer. So mm -hmm. it, it, just, it wasn't interesting to me to like sink into an admonition from one person being like some sort of ultimate judgment. It never really even crossed my mind. Uh, you know, I, re I remember being bummed by it, mm -hmm. but I took it more as like, um, shit, even after all this time, it, I, it's the work's still not good enough to, uh, to get a good reaction from somebody. So I got to like, Oh, back to the drawing board. You know, that's how I took it. And that's hard enough. You know, that's enough of a bummer. Cause no. you know, I've been drawing for, you know, like we said, since I was young, you know, I'd been, mm -hmm. I'd been practicing and drawing a lot since I was a kid. And uh, I'd been taking it very seriously for a while. So that was enough of a bummer, but I never really had, I didn't really, it didn't seem logical to me to be like, all right, well, he must be right. Just cause he was some teacher, mm. you know? Yeah. That, that never yeah. Really makes my mind. yeah. It's all, yeah. Okay. But I mean, still it's like, I, I couldn't, I could not imagine how you felt that way. I mean, I had a similar situation, but not that hard as like also being on a college. You know, I tried, I basically tried to get in just into college to made a portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I basically made an illustration portfolio for a product design um, application. And, but I, when I went there, the guy told me like, this is shit, this is shit, this is all shit. And I was like, uh, uh, okay, tell me something good, you know? And, but he, be afterwards, like after he shattered me, he built me up again and he said, okay, you have to do product design. You know, you can sketch, but it is not product design. It's illustra illustration what you've done. So yeah. just do that. Um, but it's interesting also that you now gonna be a teacher there at Art Center, right? Yeah, yeah, I am now, yeah. Yeah, yeah do, do you wanna tell us what you're gonna teach? Uh, right now I'm teaching like a, an advanced um, story and concept class. So we basically, um, I'm, I'm picking up the second half from a friend of mine who was a teacher there right now and uh, they designed or came up with a story together as a group in the class for the whole first half of the class. And then mm -hmm. the second half of the class is like locking it in with the story and then doing a, a straight concept and development work for it mm -hmm. and trying to you know, reach a certain set of deliverables for final. And then next semester I'll be teaching a class that is um, instead of coming up with the story first, it's still an advanced concept class, but you take a short story that has never been visualized before and the class together, uh, everyone can kind of go in sort of different directions, but everyone is designing assets for the same story and visualizing it. And uh, yeah, you do the first half of the class uh, doing development work, straight concept work, trying out different ideas, iterations, exploring the process, trying to arrive at something as interesting as possible. Then the second half of the class is making key shots, final paintings, uh, polishing the assets, oh. that kind of stuff. Yeah. That sounds like a really good portfolio build up for oh, yeah. anybody who, who needs that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's what Art Center was really uh is was really big on when I was there. And uh it was good. It was a good it was a good experience. Once you kind of got out of um uh, the thing about Art Center was that it felt very boot campy that like first year, maybe year and a half. And then once you got out of that boot campy phase and basically all of your classes were now straight design stuff, right? Like it was all about story and communicating things then that the boot campy feel really fell away and then things just got very that was much better you know it was really about ideas and what each individual could sort of how each individual thought about concepts and exploring things and that was fascinating that was great yeah and you also work as a freelancer right like simultaneously mm -hmm. while you teach um do you do you prefer teaching over being a freelancer or do you like both equally yeah well the in, whenever i get the question about like um about the freelance work uh and really um really just working in the industry in general it's like if you don't do one thing like if you work in games if you do illustration advertising you know what do you like best it often mm. comes up like what's the what's the best one to do i really feel you know, after you've done a bunch of things, you quickly realize it, it comes down to the project, right? So there's yeah. pl there's plenty of freelance projects I've done that are definitely not as fun as teaching. Like teaching is way more fun. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's other projects that you get on that are just, uh, they're a blast, you know, they're super fun the, the whole time, you know, but it depends on the project, you know, different projects, mm -hmm. different things. And And it's going to be different for each artist because every artist has a diff different temperament. So mm -hmm. a project that is great for one artist. And I mean, if you, when you work on a team, you very quickly see the dynamic play out, right? Like 
yeah. when you're on a project with like two or three other artists, you'll see, oh my God, I love this. And my best friend, he hates this. This is the worst <laughs> thing. so much fun, you know? Yeah. yeah. People's temperaments are really important. Uh, that's actually an interesting question. Um, when you had to, like, when you went out of Art Center in your first jobs, mm -hmm. um, how was the experience for you being on a team and, like, uh, like, what were your first kind of projects you had? Um, and was the transition actually easy from you from being a student to being a professional? Uh, I definitely, I don't think it was easy. Um, it was near the end, near the end of my time at Art Center. I went into, um, I got brought in for a bit of a stint at the studio that I would wind up staying at for three years. So uh, that put, I just bought my microphone. Sorry. Um, Don't worry. <laughs> that was a that was an agency called uh, Thinkwell Group. Uh, mm -hmm. They are a themed entertainment company. So mm -hmm. they do. Um, you know, they're in in that sector. There's few pl few studios at their size. Uh, they design theme parks, and then you know that's kind of like their top line stuff. But they design every other kind of thing besides that: museum exhibits, um, pop ups. Uh, restaurants that are heavily themed that just have like a lot of design work to do. So um, it's sort of like an architectural studio, but uh, it gets much more, um, much more blue sky, much more conceptual, much more idea heavy and uh, mm -hmm. very, very heavy on entertainment design because when you start theming things, that's, you basically are just designing video game levels that people need to be able to walk in, you know, that's what those yeah. environments become. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that that's what I went into. Um, right after school. I didn't graduate. I actually uh, stopped uh, going to school once I got that job. It just aligned with a, a bunch of stuff that was going on in my family and with my mm -hmm. life at that time where I was like, I should probably be making money instead of spending $30,000 a semester to go here. You <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, went, I went with that instead. Um, and yeah, I worked there for three years. I, uh, yeah, maybe a hair over in studio and um, the uh, the transition was not easy for me. I found it pretty tough. I actually, uh, I think after my first four weeks there, if I remember correctly, I think after my first four weeks there, I was supposed to get fired or like, well, you know, when you're there on a freelance sit, it's like, are you fired? No, it's just like your job is done now, right? You're not actually mm -hmm. fired when you're a freelancer. But um, I found out years later, uh, I didn't know at the time, but I found out years later talking with someone higher up who was like uh, one of my bosses, that I was supposed to be let go at that time. And um, they, to just fill my time until the end of that week, they threw me on a project that was like, they thought it was gonna be too, there was no one else doing it, but they thought like, it wasn't like they thought, oh, Steven would be good at this. They were just like, just have someone do something yeah. on it yeah. um, because no one's available. Uh, but I didn't know that. So I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. I'm gonna draw the hell out of this. <laughs> and, uh, I did a good job on that last thing and then when they saw the work they were like all right we can't let him go and then they kept me for you know just onward you know lesson learned <laughs> yeah, you never know you never know wow. yeah that was yeah. A, that was a lot of fun so yeah it wasn't an easy transition you know the work wasn't great uh there was definitely times where i was struggling but then mm -hmm. i'd say after that it probably took about a year to wrap my head around all that stuff. Cause it was pretty, it's, it's pretty specific stuff, you know, designing real world environments. Um, yeah. My education- It's also pretty challenging, like really do real world environments instead of like stylized stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, um, it, it was a, uh, it, that was definitely not what my education was focused on. We had a, mm. a couple classes that focused on it. And even then there was a little bit more leeway, you know, mm. but, um, but so yeah, it took a while to sort of get traction on it and sink my teeth into it. But that's interesting because that's a, that's another thing, kind of like what happened with that first teacher. Um, the uh, that class, like I said, we had a couple classes that were based on real world environments. Um, those classes were the classes I did the worst in. Those are my lowest grades, my worst crits, and the teachers thought that I was underperforming the underperforming the most. And then that was the job that I got. So mm -hmm. you just, you really can't go by grades or like straight performance in school or anything like that. You never know what's going to happen. You really never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And did you, okay. But like after, after that thing, did you um, had a point where you said, okay, 
now I arrived at the industry. Now I'm like really like sitting in my chair and I'm like safe. I have here my clients and stuff. I'm continuously moving forward while improving on my art. Was it really like after that one year or did you have that in between? Um, I would say, uh, I think it's a little bit of a gray area. Like um, mm -hmm. I'd say after the, I'd say definitely there was probably like a point within the year where I did have a brief moment where I was like, oh wait, this isn't a freelance thing anymore. This is like a job. I have like, I'm in like an art job now. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely like a moment of recognizing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then after that year was probably, you know, even though I had the job, I was like, man, this is so hard. Am I really gonna be able to keep this up or am I gonna get let go? Cause I just can't perform, right? Mm -hmm. And after that year, there was that, Across the threshold where I was like, I, you know, I felt like I had a pretty good grip on it and things were going well with the company. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I just felt like I had a place in there. Uh, so there was probably a spot in uh, right around that year point where I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm sort of, you know, I could be safe here. Right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it wasn't like, I don't think anyone ever really has a moment where you're like, I made it and now I'm relaxed and everything's easy and I'm good to, yeah. it's good to go now. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know a lot of artists who have sort of yeah. like. I think it's not the right industry for that. It's, um, but I'm just, I'm just thinking about myself. Like when I came from freelance into my first like full studio job, um, when I had this moment of having a weekend, because before I did not have a week weekend, I just worked through every day for a yeah. year. And then I had this moment of realization, okay, now you actually have a little bit of a stronger foundation just to move on and maybe to develop art wise while having this job where you continuously can like make sure you have this income you have the client you know you're not hunting for clients and stuff because it's really there's really a big difference yeah no. there is yeah yeah and um i have actually two questions i really wanted to ask you um um so uh, first um, you told me you have a morning routine and okay. that you sketch every morning, like yeah. essentials. Um, what do you sketch? Like, is it doodles, warm up, um, anatomy? Yeah, they're pretty doodly. Um, uh, I don't have it out here. Here, I'll, I'll get my morning coffee book. One second. Yes, yes, please. Hey guys, if you have questions, um, just type it in chat so we can answer them later. Um, and I also saw we have already one question, but uh, Magdalena, we're going to answer that later. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely down for questions. You know, any yeah. anything is fine with me. I don't, I don't mind. So this is like my morning. Uh, I keep this out of my coffee table on most mm -hmm. mornings, and uh, you can see it's just like. Let me make sure there's nothing in here I can't show. I think <laughs> <laughs> there's a. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty scratchy. Mm -hmm. The drawings that happen in here, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of like bleary eyed in the morning when I do it. See, I know it's blowing out a little bit, but you can kind of mm -hmm. see that they're, they're nothing special, but they're mm -hmm. just a good way to like start the day and mm -hmm. get something out. And then often there's like a, often I'll find something in here, like maybe that. If I can see, ah, like, yeah. he, like I'll find a little moment like that, which is like some weird Olmec head kind of a thing, and I'll come back nice. to that later and I'll turn that mm -hmm. into more of like a real drawing. But yeah, and, it, it's nothing. It's nothing special. It's like that. But would you say it helps you to get in the groove or like starting a day with creativity and bringing your brain up? Um, like, sure. is it just like a mental warm up for you? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. And 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 just from like um. Just from experience, I know that you know morning time is my best time for drawing. So mm -hmm. it's good to um. So for example, if I know if the client work is heavy, and I know I'm mm -hmm. just going to have to be going on the client stuff from like nine in the morning until nine o'clock at night, right? If mm -hmm. I know that it's one of those days, um, mm -hmm. the best part of my creativity for that day. Is, de is definitely going into the client work. The best, wherever the best parts come up are going into the client work. 
So just leaving a little time open in the morning with my coffee sort of also gives it a chance to like let some of that best part of my creativity wind up yeah. going into my stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. So and you do it for yourself basically, right? Yeah, yeah. And I try yeah. to keep, I try to keep that time like really like unstructured. You know, there's been times where I've like really structured it. Like there was a time recently on my Instagram where I did like a like a, a choose your own adventure. Uh, comic book on my Instagram story with like a mm -hmm. wizard and a robot and all of mm -hmm. that was like being shoved into my morning coffee time so I that was like an example of being very structured um, mm -hmm. and even that eventually got taken over by client work I had to stop doing that because then the client work was like all right you thought you had 15 minutes in the morning nope you know you're gonna just need every second of the day for <laughs> <laughs> the next yeah. or so so um but it, it gives you an opportunity to just make sure that you leave some time aside to, if you're really heavy on work, just give some of it back to yourself. Give some of your yeah. best creative energy back to yourself. Yeah. And that's such a good advice also for people who, um, I think, try to get into the industry or get into the habit even of creating. Yeah. Um, it's just to start your day with it, even if it's small, because you automatically get into that creative habit, creative routine. Um, to create something and even if you have to do other stuff um, it's it's like I said I like that that phrase of you saying essentials in the morning because yeah. it's really essential and I think even Ian McCabe mentioned it once that he's doing the same thing like having a sketchbook next to his bed and then just when he's waking up sometimes if he dreams something he's like drawing it out you know um, now that's, I mean, cool. that, that, that's that's nice that's, right that's really nice um, <laughs> have you tried have you tried that no, I've never tried that. It's interesting because it sounds like a it sounds like a dream journal essentially, but a visual one. So yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely interesting. I haven't tried it, but who knows? I might get there someday. Yeah, I tried it, but I had problems rem really like remembering visually what I saw and what I um like. It's so weird because you have this emotion of like you felt something in that, but like visual like having the moment of to really bring a crystal clear image on a paper um, out of something you had, like just dreaming about, it's really, really tricky. Um, I would really, hmm? it, it, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What were you gonna say? No, um, no, just continue. Oh. What do you wanna say? It's interesting, The um, like I never see, I rarely ever see, I spent all day trying to like visualize and draw crazy mm. stuff like really mm. crazy stuff. I never see anything crazy in my dreams. So I don't really know like what one of my dream journals, like a dream sketchbook would look like. It would just be like, you know, all of my all of my dreams are just like emotional, right? It's like, oh, there's mm. a dog in the house, but it's a really like, for some reason I'm afraid of this dog. So I would just yeah. be like a normal dog that I'm supposed to understand is really scary. Yeah. That's what my dreams are. So I don't really know if they'd get super interesting visually. Maybe that's also it's good because that leads to my second question. I really want to ask you. Okay. Um, let me uh, share the screen here for a moment um, because uh, that's something you drew, mm -hmm. and um, um, for me, it's already uh, um, always interesting to uh, understand how is your process of um, like getting inspired and um, like start starting a drawing or starting an illustration or whatever it is. And sure. then to execute it in a specific way. Do you have some sort of um, thinking process behind that? Or mm -hmm. is it a little bit more um, spontaneously driven? How does it work for you? Well, it's a big question because for me, um, <clears throat> my, my process for my personal work is very different from the process that I use for like client work. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 diver they diverge a lot. So, um, my client work has a pretty typical like design pipeline, I would say. So it's a lot of research and trying to learn about what I'm trying to depict, mm -hmm. um, analyzing the research visually. So either I do that in my head or I will do separate studies, right? Like breaking down the shapes of things. Mm -hmm. Then sketching, uh, all of this has input from my art director, of course, sketching, um, refining the sketch and then a pretty straightforward process for uh, drawing and painting. Um, and my and that that I think is pretty typical in the design world um, because that just has hard points. You need to be able to show your boss that stuff mm. and they need to see it. There needs to be like gates 
where they can analyze a certain step in the process. My personal work, uh, at least my more recent personal work, like over the last couple years, past few years, um, mm -hmm. goes through is a very different process. It's um, it is more a well, we're already going to get into the sort of like the weird stuff here, but it's like it's more a process based on trust, um, mm -hmm. which is a little weird to say. But um, I will usually if a piece, the pieces that get more developed like this one um, or uh, the the wide one that you were looking at before, there those do tend to have they have a very strong mental image in the beginning. So just in the shower, in the car, uh, while I'm out with my wife at the park or something like that, I will suddenly just, it will pop into my mind. Um, not hyper clear, but the emotion or the impression will be there in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I will, um, I will briefly, if I do, I will sketch it out a little bit, maybe in my morning coffee book, like tiny thumbnails that, um, um, that really I try not to let them capture everything about the drawing. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then once I have the tiny thumbnail and that has helped me solidify my idea, then I just get a piece of paper and I just go. And the main work in that process for me is doing my best to not freak out. That's mm -hmm. my responsibility as I do it really. So I try to not plan ahead too much Mm -hmm. I try not to get super self-critical and I try to let whatever is going to happen, happen on those drawings. And I am always looking for the moment where I'm like, I'm always looking for the moment where my brain goes, you messed this up. You didn't plan it enough. This one isn't going to pan out. You need to drop it now. It's had mm -hmm. too much time in it. I mm -hmm. look for that moment and I try to just embrace that moment and then do it anyway and then mm -hmm. push forward and just be like, that's fine. That's mm. fine. It's too much for a bad drawing. Fine. I'm fine mm. with that. We're going to get a bad drawing. It's going to have taken a month. And I accept that. I'm perfectly open to that. And then almost every time, if I actually sit there and do the work, instead of bailing out, mm. I get a drawing I like, no matter what I thought in the middle mm. of it. And that's sort of that that moment at the end is sort of what I'm going for with those. So you, you one of the one of the guys who really start something and finish it eventually that i did i wasn't always like that now now oh, okay. I'm trying to be like that so yeah. it, okay it, well it was always possible for me to you know i think a lot of people in the industry experience it it was always possible to finish stuff for a client because you know money's on the line and there's very yeah. there's good guidelines yeah. but it was always very hard to finish anything for me for me because Well, again, a lot of those years were spent doing stuff either for school or clients where it was good guidelines and took up huge amounts of time. So I was tired. And, mm -hmm. then, uh, and then, yeah, it just it, without some sort of carrot at the end, it seemed very hard to just like push through, you know, mm -hmm. especially for something that was um, kind of open ended, like it didn't fit into um, especially anything that just didn't look like it would work in like a portfolio, like an entertainment mm -hmm. portfolio portfolio or something like that. It was very hard to justify the amount of time necessary to finish that. And uh, I'm trying to fight against that now, you know, it's, <laughs> it's been yeah. very valuable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's something, it's something you really have to learn in the beginning is that how to finish stuff and how to not start all over and being not too precious with something i was more type of a person who starts like i could start like 10 different paintings or 10 different drawings on one day and start all over again on the next day because i never learned from the beginning like how to bring something to the end um but it's i still had some sort of progression yeah in the beginning and when something really became really that good i really wanted to finish it but this was like one of 30 images maybe or 40 images Right. Um, but now when time is getting so precious and like you said, you have all this client work and all that stuff and you have only this small window, even if it's in the morning, you really want to spend your time um, valuable. And that's something also I loved uh, what I saw when I joined VUGA because we have a lot of artists at VUGA and also my team, we have a lot of artists and really a lot of good artists. And um, 
most of the people they really use their time uh, next to work just to do personal stuff. Even if it's in a lunch break, if it's after work, um, they always like do something. And it doesn't have to be the greatest, craziest painting or whatever. Sometimes it is, um, but it just has to be some sort of like a cr creative wheel going and going and going because they have the need of producing something. And yeah. I think that's really important. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you if you if you don't leave that space open, it's very easy to uh, just get exhausted, get burnt out, and get kind of um, to get kind of cynical, you know, at that mm. point. Because um, you know the work, the job part of the job is a job, and mm. you know there's variably parts where it's hyper creative, and other parts where it's just not that creative. And we have to admit to ourselves as artists that you know we all have our own standards and need for exercising our creativity you know we i think we get caught up in the middle of the journey at any point in the journey with a we we get caught up with status and title and we think that like we forget that there's no way our artistic satisfaction could come from the fact that our resume has such and such title on it or something like that like mm -hmm. it, there's some people who that that will do it for them, but it's pretty yeah. rare. I think it's pretty rare amongst artists. I think artists have a particular have a. There's every kind of artist. All temperaments are artists and can be artists, but I think it skews pretty heavily towards a a more intuitive, sensitive, um, ever unsatisfied personality type. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know if you were if you were if you were inclined to be easily satisfied, I think as an artist you'd probably just do one masterpiece and then drop it, you know, and then just go on world tour with it forever. Yeah, or you will not progress or anything. It's um, yeah. I think if you if you're like happy too easily with the stuff you do, you will not gonna move anywhere forward. You're just gonna stand still. Or like you said, you will drop it eventually. But um, yeah. um it's it's also I think um it's the misconception of because I I need to admit that I also I always had the goal to work in a studio or work as a concept artist in the beginning, of course, because that's mm -hmm. your goal. That's where you want to go. You want to earn the money, but you also want to have fun and stuff. But when you come to the point, that's for me, at least it was the moment of realization. Okay. There is no real end. Like the industry is always evolving. There's always new programs, new techniques. There's new stuff you, you can learn. And also if you really have to, the drive and the fire, inside of you, you can really push yourself to get better at painting, drawing, anatomy, whatever it is, because it's, it's always going and going and going. Yep. So I think um, because I had a lot of conversations also with um, students and um, people who wanted to get into the industry, they think like, okay, they just focus so much on the job thing, but they don't understand that it's not going to enter because even if they go there, it's not going to be the finish line. Like then you sell, then it's, it's done. You don't have to hustle anymore. No. Then you have to start to hustle even more actually. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. In, in certain studios, like depending on the environment, uh, they're not going to let you settle, you know, the yeah. better you get at your job, they're going to make higher and higher demands of you. And you're going to have to know more and more like yeah. uh, at that first studio position that I did. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was just like at my computer every day and getting input from the directors and, uh, and doing pieces and getting mm -hmm. the work out and doing the concepts and finishing marketing art and stuff like that. And, uh, once I, once I did start getting it, maybe the point where I could have settled, like, all right, now the pieces, they don't get away from me anymore. There's no big disasters. I know how to do them now. They're good. Um, then once I had hit that level and people were like, all right, Steven's, Steve, Steven gets this, he knows how this works. Then they just started coming to me and they were like, all right, we, you need to come into the client meetings and you need to draw in front of the clients for eight hours a day and just do all of their ideas live, like up on the projector. And I, I, I was like, oh, okay, so now I'm <laughs> an artist when I draw these things. But it's, no pressure. but you know, I was like, all right, what is it? <laughs> you're saying that's my job, so let's do it. So yeah. that, that was like a whole new skill, right? Now, now, you know, there's nothing performative about sitting at your computer in Photoshop and, uh, and just doing the work at, at your leisure. Um, but then when you're in that environment where you're really trying to like add value in something like a client meeting, that's mm -hmm. a completely different thing. So 
yeah, depending on the needs of your studio or the needs of, even if you're just freelance, just the needs of however you decide to diversify your income, it's going to make new demands of you. You know, there's never really going to be a, a real opportunity to just, for a lot of artists, there's really not a real opportunity to settle. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, and like, if you, you have now a lot of students, I guess, like how many students do you have in your class? Uh, the class that I'm teaching right now is 15. And then I also have some. I also have some private students, which is less than that. There's only so many I can handle. But ah, okay. So it's some sort of like mentorship, like on Patreon, or mm, yeah. nice. Um, so people can also find you on Patreon. Uh, not on Patreon. My mentorship is just like you know, find me on my website, email me. Ah, okay. No, but I mean, it's good to know. I I even did not know. So uh, yeah. I will call you later about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I haven't really been. I haven't really been pushing it much because uh, I made one post about it on Instagram like mm -hmm. months and months ago, and that was enough to like. Um, with client work, it was enough to basically fill the amount of my schedule that I had for private students. So um, yeah, I haven't really been pushing it. I've been keeping it like low key because even the people who just find it by chance from like going to my website and stuff like that, that's already like quite a stream to handle. So, mm. so yeah. people, you heard that, check out his uh, website if you maybe want to get mentored by Steven. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, also his Instagram and his YouTube channel. He's, I love his YouTube channel, go on his YouTube channel. I think I even put you in my worth it uh, section, a uh, worth to discover section. Oh, uh, nice. Um, Thank you, man. I gotta check that out. Yeah, it's uh, it's just uh, um, yeah, definitely go there and uh, check out check out his uh, content um, because I really like your anatomy um, streams you did. Uh, like ev the things like for me, sometimes I even if I, I draw every day, but sometimes I just need this spark of inspiration or this like this spark of like I don't I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna draw today. Yeah, um, because like my mind is this big cloud or something, yeah. and I just watch something like your stream, and then I'm like, okay, nice. Now, now I just want to do anatomy. I just want to draw arms or something. I I watched the arm series, and I just started like just drawing arms, and I was happy yeah. afterwards. But that's, that's what's up. No, I'm that's super how it happy works. That. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Um, we actually have a question by Magdalena. Um, let me read it. Um, we know the story of the cat. And now we just uh, reviewed Dragon Ball and Star Wars parallel to this visual work. Um, he had this curio cur sorry, my English not that good. Curiosity for the inner experience when did meditation started. He also recommended already some books, but when did it all showed up? Thanks. Oh, interesting. I think I know which Magdalena is here. This is one uh, of yeah, it sounds <laughs> like she knows you. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of my students, but uh, uh, the. Uh, I guess she's asking like where the uh, where the other sort of the connection with the intuitive side of art came from, and that was really a that that ha that started happening um, pretty early on in my college years, and that was mostly because uh, that was a you know one of the big things about going to a school is that you meet so many people and you see so many different viewpoints. So when I started getting exposed to more people who were taking art very seriously, it sort of put me in my own context and I realized that I am a super analytical person and that I had a I had this viewpoint that to make quote unquote good art or successful work um, mm -hmm. that was going that the what it meant to do that was to like check all the boxes and do everything right right like if the anatomy is right then the piece is good if the lighting is right then the piece is good and then talking to other people, no small part of which was Ahmed, who really comes from like a super intuitive side of art as opposed to an analytical side and has mm -hmm. then like integrated the more analytical side. I'm not here to speak for him, but just in my opinion as his yeah. as a long time friend, um, speaking with him and other people in my program and really getting closer with them about how they did stuff really put me in my own context and made me realize like, whoa, I have this this is actually not how everybody thinks about art. Other people do just like go with the flow and do things and it works great for them. Mm -hmm. And then that really, uh, then I, I was already meditating at the time. I've sort of always, I've been into that for a very long time. And then that, once I had that realization, I realized like, oh, well, when you meditate, you do go more into that state. So maybe we can kind of like blend those together and then that began, yeah, the the long course of trying to integrate those things 
And, uh, you know, it, it's been variably uh, more normal and more weird. Like there was a time when I was practicing, when I was in the boot camp period where I was like practicing um, straight lines, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big thing in like visual communication basics. You went through industrial design, so you know about it. Yeah, yeah, we did the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was practicing a lot of straight lines. And, uh, you know, even then I had a pretty strict, I had like a morning routine thing. So I would wake up every day and I'd make sure I had at least half an hour before class where mm -hmm. I would just do the straight lines. And it was just for me, uh, not mm -hmm. just straight lines, but just like all the hand drills, you know, and oh, circles, uh, cubes, all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. At, at one point there, cause I had been reading like all this, like, uh, all this like Buddhism stuff and like Zen stuff. I just yeah. on a lark, like I tried doing the drills with my eyes closed mm -hmm. and they were more accurate than when I had my eyes open. And yeah. that infuriated me, which is really weird. And it's just, it's pure muscle memory. But I like, I thought that was so odd. So then, you know, this is like an embarrassing thing to admit, but I went like, it must've been at least a good couple weeks there where for a half hour every morning, I'd like have my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I missed some, I got some. <laughs> And then eventually I left that behind, but you know, that was like the awkward beginnings of like what really is the intuitive side of art, you know, that that's yeah. too intuitive. That's not actually actionable, I don't think. And then, uh, but then, you know, balancing it and trying to find other ways where there's some part of that, you know, you don't have your eyes closed. You're not just doing everything completely automatically, but you can do a thumbnail while kind of like looking at the corner of the paper instead mm -hmm. so that you don't mm -hmm. get caught up. You don't focus on it too much. And then when you look at it, it's kind of like a little, surprise you didn't quite know that it looked like that and then that can mm -hmm. give you a little more juice for the idea so there yeah. is something to those weird like intuitive searching things you know yeah there's, there's this rule of happy accident um but you basically became this blind monk of uh straight lines for uh, a little while there yeah, yeah. nice you know it's it's a little weird whenever i think about that because like like I just said, I'm like, you know, that's not it. You know, that that's not really something you can do. But then I do also then have the second thought, but but they were more accurate when my eyes <laughs> So I, you know, I'm not gonna like go back to that, but it yeah. is a little weird that it did work. So if anyone is in that that like boot camp stage, yeah. you can freak yourself out. Try it. Try don't it. don't be embarrassed. That I had the same experience with my girlfriend. Like in the beginning, I when I told her I want to be an artist and I start to draw every day. When I went to her place, I always had um, just like a stack of paper and a pen. And I did this every morning like you, like doing straight lines. And then she just looked over my shoulder and she was like seeing me like a madman doing just like lines and circles. He's like, when is he actually going to draw something like yeah. accurate? Yeah. He's just doing like straight lines and circles. Are we going to pay the bills one day just by like doing circles? Dude. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can look we can look a little crazy to people who have not like interacted with how hard it is and weird it is to like practice oh, things and yeah. you know art. But it's a yeah. really weird one. Yeah. How about we just move the stream a little bit to um, Photoshop? Yeah, let's are do you it. down to that? Awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely um, down to that. It, it's pretty clear to me that you and I could just talk for two hours straight, and that's for sure. So yes, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there. Yeah, so um, I think I'm just going to do a little environment sketch um, because I thought you're going to do something more figurative or maybe some do, do um, correctly. I'm just going to, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just going to, I'm just yeah. going to, since we're keeping it cash, but if anyone has any questions or anything specifically drawing related, you know, I, I can do, yeah, I can That's explain good. things in Photoshop, so. <laughs> So um, talking about projects, do you have like your most favorite projects you worked on? Um, can you talk about it actually? E now I can. So um, for there, there's a lot. There's a lot of great. There's a lot of great stuff that I've I've, I've had a lot of fun working on all sorts of stuff. But um, one of the uh, the story that I told where uh, I was about to get let go by that place and then they put me on a project that uh, they weren't serious about putting me on it, but um, I did a decent job on it. That project actually, even though it was so early on, was is still stands out as one of my favorites. And um, I'm sure it is because it's sort of aligned with those formative years, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, that now I can talk about because uh, it only just 
uh, was released. When you work in real world environments, um, it takes like eight years to build any of this stuff. So by the time it comes out, you're gonna have forgot you did it, you know? Uh, but uh, it just came out this year. It was, uh, there is a theme park in Dubai called uh, Warner Brothers Theme Park. And uh, that project that uh, I did early on at that studio, you know, I did a bunch of work on that theme park, but uh, one of the flagship rides there is a Batman night flight. And uh, that was that project and that was super fun to do. So it's like a simulator, like you're attached to a giant robot arm ride and you're going through this uh, adventure through Gotham with Batman trying to stop a bad guy. And that was so much fun to do. You know, it sounds did, nice. It was great. You know, I did a, I did storyboards on that. Did a lot. You know, things were changing super fast. Um, did a lot of design work on it too for all of the environments. And uh, it was fun because there wasn't a lot of limits on it because it was. It's the ride is a mix of real sets that you're mm -hmm. moving through and then sort of video game style media moments that you like plug into through a, through a projection screen. So really like anything was possible and we put a whole variety of things in the ride. That one really stands out. That was a lot of fun. I'd like to go ride it sometime. <laughs> Let's see. And then, um, and then near the end of my time at that studio, I did, um, I was doing designs for the World Expo also in Dubai which uh, was supposed to be this year and got postponed because of the virus to next year. That mm -hmm. was a lot of fun. I got to spend time in Dubai, uh, working with a big team over there, developing that. Um, that's, that's really cool. Cause it's like, you're working with stuff from uh, cultures that you're not familiar with. You're trying to sort of, it's a really good design challenge cause you need to design something that is, um, authentic to the environment, but you're not necessarily from there, but you're also trying to communicate like an international wide open feeling, you know, and just being in the place and getting the energy from, uh, you know, the people who have like super high stakes on something like a big world expo in that mm -hmm. environment, like getting their energy and seeing, uh, seeing all the thought that goes on into it. That was super interesting. That was super interesting. That one, the, um, that one was really, like I said, how all projects are different. Like there were times where the, where the drawings were super exciting on that, but uh, more than the drawings themselves, the, uh, the, just the energy and the, the team mentality on that was super exciting. It was fun to go through. And um, also, did you, would you ever thought that like research would be such a big component of like, the process of creating something professionally? Um, you know, I guess I, I did think so because at school they always told us like research, 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 research. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize how intense it could be until I was really doing it. Especially mm -hmm. because, um, especially because when you're in school, um, there's almost no way to avoid this. Everybody basically winds up doing the same tropes over and over again like mm. if you're going to do fantasy it's going to be inspired by dungeons and dragons if you're going to mm. do horror it's going to be inspired by hp lovecraft or now dark souls right like which wasn't a thing years ago when i was going through school mm. um it's like you you wind up getting on these tracks where everyone does very similar things so ironically enough in four years at art school after i had researched those tropes in maybe the first two years to recycle them years three and four, I was like, it doesn't need, it doesn't require that much research, you know? Mm. But then once you're working, uh, then things come up that you really, you never really, themes and, and, and art directions come up that really just never come up when you're in school, you know? Clients want such specific things. Clients are from all different demographics and age groups than you. It really comes down to like, you're going to do the ideas of people who are not you and they are interested in things that you are not interested in. And so you need to sort of do the research to compensate for that, you know? So until I was doing it, no, I don't think I ever understood how intense the research could become, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting because like we, I mean, I studied industrial design, but we never had, I would say this talk of, uh, Research is an important thing. You have to research. 
they just said it's like necessary to do or they just thought we would do it automatically but they never like talk with us about like how how deep we should research and how important is it as a foundation like a foundational thing um and uh i mean most of us most of the students did it automatically but um i had this moment of realization also very late that preparation is king and that everything I want to have a certain quality has to have a really good solid research um, and if it's historically ba like has a base in the history or it, then it's even better um, just to communicate an idea because then you have this more um, then people can relate more to it yeah yeah, yeah for sure it's essential and uh, yeah. I always tell people who um, who I like I'm like working on design chops with, you know, if we're kind of moving away from drawing chops and we're talking design chops, um, mm. I always tell them like, there's few skills more valuable than like really excellent Google foo. Like just mm. having like an intuitive understanding of what keywords to use, what to search, to find answers to the research questions that you need. And, um, you know, you build that up over the years, but it's a, uh, it's super valuable because uh, it, it's kind of its own art form, knowing how to navigate the variety of information that's on the internet and tons of good information is behind gates, like uh, like just uh, gated articles and journals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a good Absolutely. Google Foo is essential. Good Google Foo is essential. Yeah, yeah. Did no, you? Hmm? No, go ahead. I, I wasn't going to say anything of substance. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, my question was more about um, uh, when you build your portfolio, because I think that's a lot of um, students are interested in it. Um, you said like ArtStation was very heavy on building portfolios, but um, is there something you would recommend a student when they build their portfolio? Like, for catering, like going to an, a, a specific studio or a specific job? Mm. Um, so I would say in general, mm. um, if you have a specific studio that you want to go for, like a lot of people who you, a lot of people who are coming in and um, you know, if you talk to them, it's pretty common to hear like, I want to work for Riot or I want to work for Blizzard or something like that. Like there's sort of like these trends in what people want to move towards. So if you have something like that in mind, uh, tailor your portfolio to that studio for sure. Um, there's, um, there, it, it's going to increase your chances. You just need to balance it with, um, you don't want to copy them exactly generally, you know, because mm -hmm. they already know exact how to do exactly what they do right like a place like riot none of it's a mystery they know exactly how to do that right so you want to show that you understand that and that you can absolutely get there and do it but then you have a little something to contribute that you have something to add you know that there is something um that stands out about what you do even in that context mm -hmm. if you don't if you don't have a specific studio that you want to go for um I would, I would really encourage people to look very personal with what you do, because if there's one thing that I've noticed, if you look at, um, if you go on ArtStation and you look at like the lead concept artists for just pick a spread of studios, right? Mm -hmm. And just pull off the work of their lead concept artists, they all look different. They're mm -hmm. all super unique they all have like a really um, stand out vision and way that they see the world and way that they design things. Mm -hmm. So don't ignore that, you know? Um, if, you, if, you are more, if you're more interested in getting into design work generally, um, a lot of the people who hold really, um, really big positions in that world, they just have found a very unique voice. And I don't actually think that that's something that comes by accident. You know, you kind of need to work on it. Uh, you need to focus on it. And it's not like, um, it's not like, oh, you follow these and these steps to have a unique voice. It's more like you need to start getting very personal about what you actually find interesting and beautiful 
and what you find compelling, you know, it's all very personal, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say if you don't have a specific studio in mind, um, turn inward and start looking at that and get pretty serious about it and analyzing your own taste and, uh, and then move on from there. You know, I think that, I think that a, a journey inward on that will help you, will give you ideas about where you want to move and what you mm -hmm. think you would like and what you wouldn't like, you know? So basically adding your own spin to the taste of the studio. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. it's like, if you, if you think, if you don't want to, if you don't specifically want to work for like a blizzard and then your mm -hmm. style is very blizzard heavy, right? Mm -hmm. It's very inspired mm -hmm. by blizzard. Let's say that, you know, for the most part, everyone's reaction when they look at it is going to be like, oh, this looks like blizzard artwork, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's going to limit your prospects to the people who want their work to look like blizzard. But you have to remember like studios, right? Like, and there's going to be some studios out there that are like, look, we want to look like blizzard, right? There's some studios who are going to want to do that, but you have to remember that you're going to be getting hired by art directors and creative directors who are super sophisticated artists with their own taste and their own desires who have a vision and not all of them are going to just want to like look like someone else. You know, they are going to want something unique for their unique vision. So it's, it's valid to really base your look on something that's already out there, but you need to understand that it is, especially if you're not specifically gunning and focusing all your effort on working at that place, it is going to limit you to some extent. You know, I would advise, I would advise people who are, who are kind of like basing their work on a, on a look that's recognizable to, um, to do that for a while, if it's a useful scaffold to evaluate your improvement, you know, because it gets, it helps you be objective about whether you're getting better or not, but you will want to move on um, sooner rather than later, you know, it's, it's very hard to get around the fact that some of the big, it's very hard to get around the fact that if you look at the best designers and concept artists out there in the world right now, mm. almost none of them have work that looks the same. It all really stands out. You know, that's something to not be ignored. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I, I only can, I can only agree on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's important. And it's just, it's hard when you're a student because, you know, you need to, you, you feel like you need to, and you do, you need something to latch onto, you know? Mm. But, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think like the problem um, I see is that it's really daunting for the people. They go on art station and they see all this like refined published work and they see all this good work and they don't have any clue where to start, um, how to build up things. Um, and imagining like someone who don't have any possible money to go to a school or just being at home, only having the internet as a, educational um, base you have all these informations everywhere but it's completely spread and you don't know what to consume even yeah. today i feel like it. and that's the thing is like i would rather go to a program and pay some money and have somebody who is like mentoring me or maybe like pushing me in the right direction because he sees my uh, weaknesses and he, he knows where i should focus but because like being a, at home alone and learning on yourself i mean i did the same thing but it is really daunting and it takes way more time. Um, it also depends on the person, of course, because some people like back in the conceptart.org uh, days, which I never, um, which I never uh, experienced because it was uh, before my time. Um, but a lot of people from there, um, they made it. Um, I know a lot of great artists who um, got big on conceptart.org and also um, got their first jobs over that. Um, just by doing studies and doing their own illustrations, but they had this sort of like um, progression in their work and they had this drive also, and they knew like intuitively what to do to get better and to get good work out. But this is not the case for most of the people. Um, so yeah. yeah. And, and we now like, it starts to like, you have all this education everywhere. You have all the online classes, all the courses, Most of the artists do Gumroad today. You have all this information, but I mean, you can't buy everything. And even if you buy a tutorial, that doesn't mean that you really learn something from it. Um, I, for example, I do the Skillshare classes and I have uh, on one class, I have over 300 students now, but only like 
three uh, percent of that did the homework from the whole assignment. Yeah. Um, and back then, if I were to do something like an assignment, I would finish it because if I knew that somebody is there who gives me feedback or maybe gives me some sort of like valuable feedback to learn and get better, I would do it. But it's still there's this majority of people who watch the content. And I mean, I did the same. How many t tutorials did I bought and watched, but I did not like replicated them or tried everything they 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 showed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because it's like it's still this like you have to have this kind of guidance. And uh, also the creative energy really comes in waves. At the beginning, you're super excited and you start to work on something. Then you do it for 30 minutes and you're hyped and stuff. But an hour later, like your energy level goes down and you have to learn like everything comes in waves. And at some point you have to maybe stop, take a break. Yeah. And you don't have to finish everything on one day. It's yeah. not a sprint. It's really a marathon, like planning your week or something. Yeah, um, that's a big thing. The energy management, figuring out how to manage your energy personally. That's a huge, I think that's a huge part of the, yeah. of the artist journey. Yeah. Yeah. Like every, everyone gets their own little like system. Like, you know, I have my, you know, my morning routine is based on energy management, right? I know that my art comes out best in the morning generally. And mm -hmm. that, um, I know that I have a slump at like 2 p.m. So mm -hmm. at that time, that's, wh that's when I schedule my run. And that's when I go mm -hmm. to get some exercise. And then that mm -hmm. gets the blood flowing and it lets me clear my mind, get less stressed. And a lot of good ideas come when you're doing exercise too. It's like a, if, it, if it's exercise that you feel comfortable doing, it's, it's a very, um, it can become a flow state on its own. And then some ideas can come to you while you're in there. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm. And, then, and, then, and then to know that basically nothing will get done after 8 p.m. So leave the, the easiest things for after that, you know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it's it's also different from people to uh, person to person. I have I have actually a friend um, who's a really good artist. Uh, he's working at Karakta, um, Adrian Wilkins. He's an amazing character artist, and he's I don't know. He got this uh, uh, Son Goku power level. You know, he goes to work and uh, he's working like a beast at work, and then he comes home at. I don't know, midnight, and he's doing another thing, like doing more sketches and more stuff. And then he gets up in the morning and does it again. And when I call him every time or when I text him, I'm asking, what are you doing? In his free time, he's still working and doing his own stuff. He got this like endless Super Saiyan power level of art wow. um, while doing all the stuff. But he's like very, very rare. Like yeah. most of the other people I've talked to, they don't have this energy. And uh, it's finding like finding your capable like understanding your capacities and also like what are you capable of in a specific range of time to create something is really important i think yep more power to them i mean geez i i envy people who just have that bottomless well of energy yeah i certainly yeah. don't uh 24 ask is the vod available later on to yes um I will upload it definitely on the YouTube channel. Um, maybe Steve will also upload it on his, um, but it's definitely going to be up somewhere. For sure. Uh, um, Magdalena asks, hi there, shy people today around in the chat. How's everybody doing? Anyone sketching, drinking coffee? <laughs> no, just chilling. Yes. Um, yeah, if you have any questions to Steven or to me, just ask them in the chat. Um, we try to answer them as good as we can. Yeah. We're open books here. Yes. What am I going to draw here? Um, also, do you have, um, I have so many questions I wanted to ask you. Um, Love it. If people are not asking, I will ask. Um, do you have, uh, do you have any like um, future plans when it comes to like your freelance work? Um, because like, like, like you said, now you're freelancing and teaching. Um, mm -hmm. Would you, could you see yourself like only teach in the future or going in-house somewhere or going, building your own thing somewhere or I don't know? Um, I've definitely had thoughts about, um, I've definitely had thoughts about building my own thing before, but that's like, it's more about the excitement of building something. Like it always changes what it would be. So who knows, that's pretty airy, uh, possible in the future. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say right now I'm, 
I'd say right now I'm exploring the teaching stuff more because mm -hmm. that's, um, I find that super gratifying, you know, it's like a very, um, I mean, if you like teaching, it's like, it is really, you really like it, you know, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a super gratifying experience to go through and watching people improve is like watching people improve doing, doing stuff that you're helping with is like a way crazier high than like anything that happens during work for me mm -hmm. personally, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that's really gratifying for me. So I'm exploring that more. Um, you know, I had like, for example, YouTube, which I'm also lumping into the teaching kind of stuff, like almost everything that's on my YouTube right now was done in like an open two months from client work. And then mm -hmm. like, it, it all happened there. Like I dumped all those videos in that time and then that's it. And, uh, and I've gotten just like the messages that I get from people from people about that mm -hmm. and like having discussions with people from that, that has been super gratifying. So um, I'm looking forward to doing way more of that and like putting more time into it. Cause like I've already had such interesting conversations and made such great connections. Like you are an example uh, just from like really like a pretty, a pretty modest, uh, a pretty modest beginning of putting content out on YouTube. So, uh, I find that super promising. It really does just come down to the, um, to the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really is all, but I'm hoping to do way more of it now. I'm actually, um, right now for like the past, uh, for the past, um, few weeks, I've been taking a little break from the client work cause, uh, things slowed down with my client because of the virus. And then I was mm -hmm. like, all right, well, I've been wanting to try out this, you uh, get back to little YouTube stuff. So I'm taking the, I'm taking the little dip as an opportunity to make more things. I actually have a bunch of YouTube videos like banked. I'm sitting on like seven right now or something like oh, okay. that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, which is kind of what I did on that last push. I was like, um, I, uh, I did them all like ahead of time. And then once I had to go back into the client hole, that's when I started posting them, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm kind of trying to do that again, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of dipping my toe back into that world and I'm very excited for it. Nice. Yeah. I think YouTube is also such a great thing. If you think about like from a point of discovering uh, concept art and uh, people just stumble over videos of Feng Zhu and stuff and getting inspired to pursue a career like that. It's uh, such an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, and I also think like there is, um, it's good to give something back at some point. Um, just that's, for example, like for me was the reason to start um, at some point to start my own YouTube channel because I started because of YouTube, uh, because of Feng Zhu's video. I was one of that people um, and I think that's also a great thing to just maybe inspire somebody else to, um, pursue that career. Yeah, for sure, man. It's very, uh, yeah. I mean, and any, any little trickle of that sort of becoming a part of like the inspiration feedback loop is, uh, oh, it's super gratifying, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember I was like, um, I, I remember uh, I, I worked on, um, I worked on, uh, sorry, I'm spacing out because I'm also painting while I'm talking, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> I, worked on, I worked on elder scrolls for a while, uh, a couple of years ago and, uh, I did a bunch of expansions and then while I was working on it, I really like in doing research and having to like figure stuff out for the work, I really conditioned my, uh, YouTube algorithm to just like show me every elder scrolls thing that gets posted. So when I, when I was done on the project, um, some time went by and then I remember, um, I remember YouTube recommended me a YouTuber, like reviewing a set of things that I had designed for the game. And I was like, Oh, now this is just like abject fascination for designers. Like, let's see how this goes over, how this is going over with the public. And, uh, you know, it was like this surreal moment. That was the first time, um, like I said, like at that time, like all of my real world designs that I had done, like almost none of this stuff had been built yet and it hadn't been released to the public. So there was no like, 
none of it had become real. So mm. this early Elder Scrolls stuff that became real, right? That like it was out there as a product in the world and people were like interacting with it now. Um, I, um, I went and watched it and uh, it was just like surreal to like watch someone who just like had no idea uh, uh, interfacing with this thing that I'd put all this intimate time in. And I remember thinking like, oh, is th this is probably, this is like, this is professional gratification right here, right? Like, I'm not sure I'm feeling it, but I know that this must be it. And then the first time that I got an email from someone who had watched my YouTube and in the email it said, you really helped me calm down while I was drawing. I was like, ooh, like fist banging in my room. Like I got such a rush out of it. And I thought that, that I, it was like on a completely different level. It was on a completely mm. different order of energy. It was, uh, I think I got hooked after that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's such an amazing thing. Um, also seeing like when students um, have a moment of realization um, or learning something, it's uh, a very great feeling to have, um, I can say. I had just recently my first on-site teaching experience. Um, yeah, and it was we'll your blog about that. That's great. Yeah, that's, it was such an interesting thing to, uh, to not talk to a camera and just putting this online content out there um, and just to see like people like consuming it but having no real feedback. Uh, instead of having physically 10 people, 20 people sitting in front of you, listening to you, and then like seeing, okay, did they understand what I said? Uh, did it make sense? Um, and it's, it's such a different, but a really nice experience to have. For um, sure. Yeah. Very, it's very gratifying. Yeah, absolutely. And the energy, you can't beat the energy. It just gives you such a rush, you know? Yes. Yes. And, and did, when you teach the first time, did you have to like, was it easy for you to, to teach? Um, it was because, uh, I, um, I'd already been mentoring people like online for, a, for a while. So I was very used to like the, um, the setup, you know, doing it online and all that. Mm. And, um, you know, I've done a bit, uh, I've only done like one real, like in-person teaching. I did a, I did a workshop out here in New York with a uh, robot pencil and modern day James back in, mm, nice. back in December last year. So that was like a day long in-person workshop. And that was a, mm. that was great fun, and uh, you know that yeah I think that was, was that the, I think that was basically the first time I ever taught um, in person, and yeah mm. a lot of great energy there that was a blast. Nice, but yeah I've not, I've, I've definitely I've also um, you know just like presenting and um, explaining my ideas to people that's always come kind of kind of naturally like. That doesn't really stress me out a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, and definitely, you know, going to design school will hammer that out of you after your like thirtieth uh, final presentation, where you're pitching in front of everybody. So, yeah. teach, teach, <laughs> teaching really feels either the same or or more low pressure. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, we have questions. Um... Da, 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 da. Working drawing. Da, da, da. Question for both of you: What was the lesson you watched on YouTube that you thought it was really helpful for your personal drive, or that you thought, "How didn't I do this before?" You go first. Hmm. Uh, specifically on YouTube, um, that's a hard one for me because I, I really, um, I, uh, I most of my like art learning online was before art videos were big on YouTube, you know, like 08, 09, 2010, stuff like that. Like art videos hadn't really blossomed on YouTube, on YouTube at that point. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really watching a lot of YouTube. I can tell you that, um, uh, you know, if we move outside of YouTube, I remember that uh, Ian McCabe's uh, you, uh, Nomon DVDs were, uh, definitely gave me a lot of moments that were like that where i was like whoa really you can just think about it that way okay mm -hmm. i remember those really stood out that's interesting i i never saw his uh his um norman dvds what was it about just like illustrating or 
Yeah, he took, um, it was a series of DVDs where he illust like illustrated and at the same time redesigned The Little Mermaid. And that was, um, they are great. They are great. He's just so casual about it. And he mm -hmm. focuses on like the, on the fun of drawing. And like mm -hmm. I was saying before, I was very fascinated in my early education with like balancing my analytical side with my intuitive side. So he was a really big part of that, or that was a very formative uh, video series for me. Mm -hmm. I forget what it was called, but uh, if you search, uh, you know, Noman and Ian McKay, like something will come right up. Thanks. I think I will look it up because I'm a big Ian McKay fan and I also got his book, but I was wondering if he ever had any, any like educational stuff online. Um, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. uh, for me, YouTube wise, uh, YouTube wise, I would say, hmm, I think like when it comes to anatomy, I would say Proco was really a big uh, helper because I was going through all the PDFs and everything I could find on the internet. Um, but then I found uh, Proco's um, YouTube channel and when he did all the um, sim simplifications of the how to draw a head and how to structure stuff, um, that was really, really helpful. Um, and when it comes to concept art and Gumroad and everything else, I would say mm, John Park's uh, uh, Gumroad videos, um, especially he had one where he talked about um, where he did little thumbnail sketches with pencil um, for environments. And uh, I had this realization um, that because I always was so focused on digital, that I never, it never came to my mind at this point that I actually can just do a pencil sketch, render and shade the pencil sketch and put my light in very quickly um, instead of doing it digitally because I was really bad at Photoshop at that time and pencil was way easier. So I just did pencil um, and that was really, really a little like, uh, I would say learning point for me. And I also have another learning point um, because about the artist I talked before, Adrian, Adrian Wilkins, um, uh, because back then when I joined, like, or when I started to uh, uh, going to pursue the concept art dream, we had this uh, drink and draw events, which we still have uh, here in Berlin. Um, and there were a lot of artists. And um, I remember first time I looked through his sketchbook and he used a mechanical pencil to um, draw faces and he, was super, super efficient in the way of drawing them. And I really wanted to understand how he did that. So I was just like going through a sketchbook again and again. And later on we became friends and then we chilled at his place sometimes. And I still had all, all the time his sketchbooks like going through all the sketches because all the faces looked so perfectly and worked in values and contrasts and everything was so good. And I really wanted to understand how is it actually that he's going to do it and in such a simple way? And that really helped me because I tried to replicate it at some point. And there was this learning curve of like, okay, it's just an indication of an eye, indication of a cast shadow of a nose, indication of uh, the contact shadow of the mouth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was really big for me. Yeah, please, uh, please make art friends, everybody. That's definitely yeah. a priority. Yeah. That's, that's really important. All um, 24 said Steven's video are really calming and I, re I relate to that. I come back to Steven's videos every three months or just to chill. Thanks 24, that's great to hear, man. Um, hey, Alnura is also here. Um, she's writing, Everyone. is it really not important to artists to have their own style when they need at the end in working to follow studios company style? Uh, I think so. I think it is, uh, you know, uh, this is, this might sound super cynical, but it's like, if you, if you're looking for a job in art and concept art, you'll get a job, you know, you, you will find one. I promise you that there is no, there is no lack of people who are looking to, uh, take advantage of your creativity and pay you little and, you know, just use you to create. 
huge amounts of value and productivity for them and for their company, right? Like there's no, there's just no lack of that. You, I have no doubt that if you put your mind to it, if you're looking for a job, you will get a job. But if you are anything like the artists that I have met and have known all of my life, you're going to need something more than that. There's always something more than that for you. So you have to at least somewhat prioritize what you are going through because you are the source for that stuff. And there can be a really like bully attitude with art these days online where it's like, don't take it personal. It's not about you, man. It's just your work and get hard crits and da da da. And that, all that stuff is true, mm. but it is, I think it's a little unrealistic to expect that we don't personally connect with what we do as artists. Mm. I, think, uh, I think when you burrow down, we all do personally connect. So I'm not saying don't have concerns for the styles that you need to meet. You do need to hit the quality, but don't, don't, don't lose yourself and don't ignore the fact that the people who do the best in this industry have really kept themselves a lot of the time. You know, they have found something unique that people just can't get enough of, you know? So yeah. hold on to that. Absolutely. I agree on that. Also like, if you apply somewhere, um, people see if you just um, try to replicate something or if you have your own type of style and if you want to give your own little spin. Also, if you put in the extra amount of work, like the people who hire other people in studios are very experienced. They see tons of portfolios and they see if somebody is on a student level and is just like doing this, this the normal student stuff or if if the person is really a professional or is like ready to enter the professional level um, if they see you have strong foundations but you also are creative and you have your own personal taste and spin and we had this a lot of times at VUGA that we hired people who had a portfolio which maybe didn't match the, port the VUGA style so much but it was still stylized and it was good and well executed and the people got hired because they were interesting and they had an interesting story to tell. And I think that's really important to, to, to keep in mind when you develop your, uh, your portfolio. How did you, um, how did you wind up at Wuga? Am I pronouncing it? It's Wuga, right? It's Wuga. Yeah. How, how, um, how did you, uh, how did you wind up there? Did you apply? Did you know somebody? So, um, I, I give you the I give you the quick story. So basically, I was um, working in a studio while I was studying, which was a commercial studio, and I was the only concepter there. And we had a conversation of that they keep me at the studio, maybe if they have enough work. So it came to the point, like um, sadly, that they did not have enough work, so I had to leave, um, which was fine. But I thought, like, okay, I will somehow find a job after finishing college. It was right after college. So I applied at 200 places and uh, wrote over 200 emails and did a lot of art tests, but I didn't get in anywhere. And I had to work in a sports equipment shop to sell sports equipment for, I think, one month or two months to just pay my bills. Um, and simultaneously, I was working on my portfolio and uh, I was applying still everywhere, like sending out emails every day and hustle, hustle, hustle. And it took me, I think, six weeks to get my first job, which was a, um, a movie job, actually, on an animation movie, uh, not in Berlin, was in a studio in Stuttgart. And, uh, um, and I was lucky because my brother was working there, but I still had to do a test. But uh, my test was good enough. So I went there on a project for um, eight weeks. Um, and everything went well. And while I was there, um, I went to all the other studios around to just to introduce myself. Like, I'm this guy, I work here on that project, showed my portfolio around just to still keep in mind, okay, after this job, I need another job. Right. So I had some small freelance jobs extra besides the other project I was there. So I was working remotely at, uh, in, in Stuttgart in the studio and was sleeping on my brother's couch, which was good because I had no money. Um, and when I came back to Berlin, I had another gig planned and was all like almost to, to uh, jump on that gig. And then a, f uh, a friend of mine, um, told me that he actually going to start to be a lead artist at Vuga in Berlin, that he moved to Berlin. And he told me that they look for a character artist. And 
he, he asked me if I just uh, if I would like to apply um, and I thought like well why not trying it I mean at least I can try it and maybe learn something and if it doesn't work out I have my freelance stuff so um, I applied there and I had a very good conversation with the um, with the uh, art director the with the art um, uh, how's this position called like the the I think the head of art in the studio mm -hmm. um, he's a really nice guy and we had a really good conversation he asked me if I could do a test I said yes and I think I only usually they have a week to do the test and I only had like four days or something and it was a little bit tricky but I said okay fuck it if I don't go to sleep for the next three days I, I don't mind it doesn't matter so I did that and I really worked my uh, my butt off to get a good test down and it worked and I got and uh, invited again to to the conversation with all the teams and stuff and i was lucky or i would say it was lucky because i had a second portfolio with all the environment stuff i did for the movies oh, and right. and then it uh, came out that they actually needed someone for the environments not really for the characters so nice. i got hired as an environment artist instead of a character artist which i applied for and um yeah and uh then since then I stayed there and uh, it's I, I, I can say it with all my heart and Vuga is such an awesome great company great people great teams great management um, great work-life balance um, absolutely I can also if you were a beginner or you want to get into the industry because it's mobile games um, you it's a very good start to get a feeling and understanding of uh, uh, of um, of the how an industry works how a pipeline works and stuff. And it's a really nice place, place to work. Absolutely. That's great. I love to hear that it's well managed and all of that, you know, it, it, it's, it's always, it's always hard when, uh, when it's just, you hear know, <laughs> people being on great projects, but, uh, but just the management is now good or just like the lifestyle. Mm. You know, mm. That's great to hear. Yeah. And it's, you know, like I heard so many different stories from so many people who said they're lucky, but I think also if you continuously work like, work on yourself, work on the stuff you do and be productive, you move yourself into the position of being lucky, not without doing the work. Um, because I think if I didn't have the portfolio or if I didn't have the, the knowledge or the um, skills to to do the art test, you don't you don't get in. I mean, how, how do you get in? You just know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody and then you go, you get in. No, you have to be able to perform at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also, like, in the beginning, I was really frustrated because, like I said, I sent out, like, over 200 emails. And um, I have this never giving up attitude, but I did not understand why do I have to um, do an artist everywhere, even if I applied for positions where I only had to do, like, 2D pixel art and stuff, you know? But they always wanted to make me doing an art test, which cost me maybe five days. And uh, I always thought myself, okay, I do that, but... Like, who's going to pay me the five days, even if it's just an art test? Because I have to put in so much energy and time and stuff. Um, but I had to learn that that this trust you receive from the studio, that they invest money into you, they really have to, to really think about it very, very deeply to give you that trust. And they have to really to see that. So um, just for you guys, if you're in the same position at some, at some point that you... Um, Think about, oh, I have to do the art test. Really give everything you got into that art test and see it as an opportunity to maybe get to the next step um, or to get into the industry. It doesn't matter. But if you have the opportunity, really give everything you have. Um, because after, if you're not, you will definitely regret that later on. Very good advice. Yeah. Um, Puckboy writes, hi, Steven. You're a legend. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> um, I'm not too convinced, but I appreciate uh, <laughs> uh, I knew I said thank you, both of you. You're welcome. Um, uh, 24 said, yeah, I think so. Something he would draw, a demon. I had to ask if you draw a demon. Oh, yeah, I definitely am right now. This is my this is my go-to when I need to just do what I do. <laughs> nice. At, at, at least I made a little scene this time instead of just doing the uh, instead of just doing the character. Mm. I do uh, you know I 
we get on, I get, I get on these, uh, generally when I'm besides my personal work, when I'm just like sketching, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll do, I always wind up doing stuff that is not what I'm doing for work. And, uh, usually a lot of my freelance stuff is like complete environments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so that makes it really hard with my own sketching to, um, then, continue on to like do new complete environments. So I wind up doing a lot of solos a lot mm -hmm. on art, but uh, yeah, uh, cause I, cause I have a little break from work here. It like rebooted my battery and now I have the, uh, now I have the energy to sort of do my sketches as like complete scenes instead of just solo. So that's nice. Do you also always do the opposite of what you do for work that you, when you do like environment for work, that you do characters and your personal stuff? Yeah, I, I don't I don't do it on purpose. It's like if I look back and like track it, I realize that that almost always happens. But it's not on mm -hmm. purpose. It's just mm -hmm. like yeah, it's just like if I if I was gonna do like yeah, just it would be really hard for me to just um to like do like three characters for work or something, and then just do another character at night for my personal time or something. It just always mm -hmm. winds up being a it always winds up being some sort of counterpoint. Mm. Yeah, I have, I have the same thing. Like, I always do the opposite. Yeah. Um, but I also have like the problem that I want to do everything, you know, like I want to get better at characters, want to get better at environments. But when you get smaller time and time and time, you realize, man, you have to really, <laughs> you really have to focus on one thing really to, uh, to, to, to progress like efficient, efficient over yeah. time. I know. Yeah. I, I feel you. That's that's why I'm always a uh, I'm always pretty glad when uh when I get a little when I get sort of my broader energy back, uh, mm -hmm. and I can do because my my goal my goal ultimately is um with art is more complete scenes right like it's not just it's not just solos they're um you know my goals are not really like illustration looking things like this it's more like my bigger more elaborate pencil drawings but. Um, mm -hmm those are still, you know, they're not just one thing, they're complete compositions. So it always feels good to get the sketching energy back to do that because it's uh, it's the best way to practice it, you know? Mm. So, yeah. so, you know, a lot of people can come at you with, um, or like students will be like, you know, what should I draw, you know, a thousand of these, a hundred of these, or to get better at that. And it's like, you know, I, I rarely ever really say this to students and it's like, I do advise them like, yeah, do a thousand hands or a hundred heads or something like that. But at a certain point also in your career, you're going to have to really look at yourself and be like, maybe I should do a hundred pictures I really care about. Maybe that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 And that, that's also, that's the pitfall of those challenges, right? I, I do a lot of challenges myself because I like the challenge itself, but if you're in a position that you need a job, it's maybe not so good to make to spend all the time um, for doing those challenges. Yeah. So it's yeah, I think it's it's a great addition, but like you said, it's it really makes if you need to make a portfolio, it makes more sense to focus on that, like making images that you like and you can maybe use for your portfolio. Yep. Yeah. You kind of gotta an interesting thing about like guiding your own art journey is that mm. so much of that is setting your own priorities and it's mm. uh, it's super hard. And like you were saying before, there's so much art information out there online and the, the ubiquitous tone of all art instruction. Like if you grab a Gumroad video is like your priority should be the thing in this video. Right. And it's like, of course, that's that's that makes sense for the product, but truly, as an artist, you really do need to set your own priorities at a point. Yeah. And um, and we also, you know, we we as artists, you know, we're so expansive. You know, we're we're creative people. We create things kind of from nothing. It's easy for us to have very expansive personalities that are like everything all the time. I got to be the best. I can't just be good. I've got to be the best I can be. I can, I got to make the best work possible. You know, we get very expansive so we can kind of like, yeah, we get this shotgun mind approach where it makes it very hard to focus. And it's like, realistically, you know, some of your favorite artists, like everyone, if you list your favorite artists, if you really break down their work, they're not good at 
everything. They're good at like a very specific thing that makes them stand out, you know? And they have like a really high level of quality in that area. Um, mm. So I think that that's important to remember too. Like it is important to get sort of a generalized skill set and to sort of understand what makes art work in a broad mm. way. But mm. you, realistically speaking, at a certain point, you must kind of zero in on what is really speaking to you about your own work. And, um, and you're gonna almost inevitably, you will wind up putting more energy into that than the other things, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have like a, do you have a thing in your practice that you feel like this is my favorite thing? This is what I do. This is like, Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I need to say it's uh, it changed a lot because when I was on the journey to to get into a studio, I was doing a lot of like I did the the circle drawings and the line drawings and stuff. I did that every day for like a long, long time, and I did this always for warm up. And now it's different. Um, I had this. I tried to 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 change my um my my working routine in the way that i got i get up in the morning before work i do some sketches um about an hour so i get warmed up before i go to work then i go to work and then i do usually in lunch at lunch i eat 30 minutes and the other 30 minutes i do a sketch or a painting or something um and then when i come home and i don't go to gym or something i work again on the other stuff and i still in a moment that that I now try to do YouTube simultaneously and doing online classes and everything, I try to fa find the best possible work without having now the pressure of building a portfolio. I just ask myself, what do I want to work on? What do I want to do? Where do I want to pro progress? And I do a lot of writing where I plan a lot of YouTube content and online teaching content, but I also spend a lot of time on going back on my skill shared and going through the homework stuff and look what I can improve on, watch my own videos. Um, then I do the other teaching stuff. Sometimes I do also freelance gigs, um, just uh, just illustrations and stuff. Um, but and at right now it is like being at home. What I like to do is um, in the morning, just after breakfast, is doing a couple sketches um, before the first meeting. Um, or just doing sketches and then doing emails because I have to answer and write a lot of emails at work. Um, and then I would say for me, it's almost the lunch break is very consistent. So I always do my work in my lunch break. Um, and I try to do at least a small thing every single day um, just to progress because I, I learned about myself that I'm the type of person I don't want to do everything on a very short amount of time. I really want to do a little bit every day because then also my brain can process everything. Even if I learn something, um, that's really, for me, I have this really, this marathon um, thing in my head. I really want to, that is to so um, that's what it's yeah, but it's also, it's also very hard because I, you, I mean, I still even have the, this thing, like you go on art station or you go on Instagram and I have so many friends who are so productive and they produce some, so much good stuff every day. And then you feel like, oh man, I did, I planned my YouTube. I, I maybe did a YouTube video and I did an online class or anything, but I didn't draw or paint so much as I would like to, or I didn't did the Instagram post or whatever. And, mm -hmm. That's something which also stressed me out a little bit, you know, and I even I even took a little bit time off of social media um, before my vacation um, because I was so stressed out about all that like right. Instagram chisel. Yeah, that stuff really it, it can get in you. It can claw its way inside your mind for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, it, and, and it's difficult when we it's difficult. It really hurts comparing yourself to others you know that's true in anything in life and absolutely uh, it's really hard in the art world because you're just constantly getting exposed to like the best stuff out there you know it's just so accessible so yeah the, the instagram break is super valuable tool for anyone out there it's good and that's all that's also a really good point that you brought up like um do not ever compare yourself to others 
um, because it's not fair to yourself. Um, it's, that's, it's, yeah. not fair to, it's not fair to yourself. It's also not fair to them. Like you don't actually know what they're going through. You know, they might be being yeah. super productive, but they're just like, you know, having a really hard time and depressed. It's like you're, you're making up what you think their yeah. situation is, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Ahmed is here. Hey, hey, Ahmed, how's it going? Ed, what's up, bud? Um, oh, we have some, some more things. Um, for Ahmed, it's cute girls and nothing else. Yeah, <laughs> Ahmed is definitely into cute girls. Yeah, you might. Hey, say, Hannes. You might say so. Hey, Med, you're doing. Uh, you have a stream tonight too, don't you? Aren't you doing with uh, Adam Duff? Is that his name? I think so. Yeah. True. I hadn't put that together in my head before. Yeah, I, th I think so. He has this. Uh, he has this uh, live stream today, or is it done already? I don't know. Matthew, yes, sir. He says. There you go. That's gonna be a good yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> he said, "LMAO, I join right when someone talks about me." <laughs> You're you're always on the tip of everybody's tongue, Med. Yes, we always talk about you, Med. <laughs> what were we talking about right before that? I forget now. Um, comparing, we talked about comparing yourself. Yes. Yeah, and very yes. yeah. Do do be caught. Any anyone who's out there, early on in the journey, it's like the comparing yourself is it's useful to a point, but it's like. <laughs> it's useful to a very short point, just to like getting your head around what you're trying to improve at and stuff like that. Everything else, it, it just compounds wildly. And yeah, again, like I said, there's just, you're making it up, you know, you really don't know anything about that person's situation. You know, you're sort of just like constructing this ghost version of what they are going through and how they're doing their work. And it's mm. just sort of like, it's self-serving to a certain extent. like you are constructing that completely uninformed version of them and their work to put yourself down, you know, to compare yourself to it. And you just have no evidence most of the time, right? Like yeah. maybe it's a little different if you're comparing yourself to like your direct friends, but like just like social media stuff where it's just like, you really don't know those people at all, like at all. It's just, it's so poisonous to, to construct that vision of them and compare yourself to them. Yeah, and, and it brings you nothing at the end. Yep. I mean, you, you just drive yourself crazy and it will not help you um, to proceed or to, right. to get to a certain point that somehow. Um, and jealousy, I mean, is the, I think it's really poison for your own artistic growth. Yeah, I mean, if you just listen to everybody's journeys uh, in the art world, it's like hardly anyone, hardly anyone credits their progress and their journey to a constantly comparing themselves to others, right? <laughs> Maybe they start there, but then at some point, everyone has to have a moment where they realize that, you know, they had to look mm -hmm. inward and it was kind of about them at a certain yeah. point. It wasn't really yeah. about everybody else and what everybody else thought. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you um, do you also do art on a weekend? Um, or do you have your, do you do your routine every day? Or is it more of, um, more something would you do under the week basically like um i find art super relaxing at this point you know so mm -hmm. um you know if i if i'm i i, I do often it, it doesn't tax me too much to continue working after work on my own stuff i find art relaxing and i find doing my own stuff um really exciting you know so yeah i do if i if i don't have anything if I don't have anything on the schedule, if I don't have anything planned, like somewhere that I'm supposed to be or something I'm gonna go do, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I draw, I sit and draw. It's just, um, you know, it's it's super addictive and we all know that, you know, that's why we're on the journey. It's like the the fact that truly, like you never know when a good drawing is gonna come out, right? Like yeah. you never quite know how that sitting is gonna go is just, it gets your claw, it gets its claws in you. And you just mm. get hooked, you know? You have yeah. to come back. It's like um, drawing is like a, like you ever watch a TV show that is like really embarrassingly bad 60% of the time 
And then like 40% of the time you're like, oh, it's so good. Now, now it's good again, this episode rocks. And then even though it's crap, most of the time you can't stop watching it. It's really, it feels like that a lot of the time. Can you give an example? Um, oh, this is a really embarrassing one, but like. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we want to know. <laughs> this is a really embarrassing example, but like early seasons of True Blood, that HBO vampire show was uh -huh. absolute garbage for most of it. And then occasionally there'd be like weird world building stuff, like a Japanese company developed this blood substitute and that allowed vampires to be out. And like, that was cool. That was genuinely super cool, you know? And it was like mm. thoughtful and in it had like interesting like design ideas in it. But then the rest of the time it was just like saccharine poo poo, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it was so addictive. It was so addictive. I actually managed to get off that train, but uh, for other people like my wife, she just, she felt the same way. She had to catch no judgment. She could not stop. She could not stop. Nice. So yeah, that 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 kind of feels somewhat analogous to uh, the like um, the art journey, where it's just like if it goes right, like even like one third of the time, you just get hooked. You get stuck. You know, mm -hmm. you really just always want to be there. Like you know finding out what's going to come out that sitting. Yeah, that's true. Well, we also have another question for Steve. What's up? Steven. Can you talk about your mentorship program? Because I was looking for one recently. Um, so it's pretty flexible. It's pretty open. Uh, everyone who I'm mentoring right now, I'm basically doing different stuff with all of them, you know, because uh, I think that that's what mentorship is. Um, about ideally it's about having where you are on the journey sort of get identified and then addressed directly and not being shoved into like a a one size fits all mentality i think uh, i think one size fits all is probably a faster uh not one size fits all uh one on one is a faster way to improve uh one size fits all like a kind of like the art school mentality uh, works, it, you, it does give you a wide base of exposure and it teaches you a lot, but it becomes so generalized that there's really few ways for it to make you better without it taking, yeah, four years, you know, six years, mm -hmm. something like that. So yeah, I'm basically doing something different with everyone, but it varies. You know, some of my students, uh, what I do with them is that they, they are, they are the kind of student that they have creative personal ideas like pictures that they want to work on and that's their focus and I love that so they come to me and I just give them pain overs you know I critique individual pieces and then they go off and finish I have other students who they don't feel ready for that you know they're just like they they are really more in like a drilling practicing mode and uh, they're not so comfortable just um, doing the journey by doing their own artwork so for them it's more like I'm laying out like they're going to practice this and this this week uh, I'm going to force you to do a creative piece at this point, and then you're going to bring it back and you're, you're you know, I'm going to critique it. So it really depends on the student's temperament, what they're comfortable with, and um, sort of where they are on the path. You know, if I see that someone is just like, they really don't have, um, if someone comes to me and I see that like, they really don't have the necessary base, even as, you know, in my assessment, if I'm like, you know, you, if I'm like, you're going to wind up paying me for mentorship so that I can tell you to draw boxes. It's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I'm just going to tell you honestly, like go to this website, practice that, come back soon and we'll figure something out, you know? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the, uh, it depends on the student's level. Yeah. And also, like you said, it's uh, really important. Um, and it also makes total sense to care uh, mentorship to, personality and also to the development of the person because everybody develops different and I think it's also um, it speaks for your uh, capabilities of mentoring people that you pointed out also Ahmed said Stephen is a great teacher ah. I think so I think so too thank you Matt you're very kind and thank you uh, Melanie said dude yeah I love listening to him talk uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Puckboy asks, what is the origin of sheephorn demons? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not. I'm sure it's something vaguely pagan, right? Some sort of animist thing. 
yeah. I know that I know that the classic ram heads demon is uh, often associated with Baphomet, but uh, like so much of that stuff, I'm sure that it is all tied up with um, Christian missionaries incorporating animist and pagan uh, gods into various positive and or negative roles in order to set up Christian conversions with some sort of relatability. So I don't really know how that happened specifically for ram-headed demons, but that's how it went for most of them. So. I'm assuming it has something to do with that. To add my knowledge to that, I said yes. <laughs> 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 because I don't have any clue. Weird um, stuff, man. It's weird stuff. Um, Mateus, a uh, question for both of you. How do you guys get good ideas to draw? I always feel motivated to do stuff, but when I face the paper, it doesn't come nothing into my mind. Well... Um, You can go ahead first. Um, so that's also something I had problem with for quite a long time. And um, it also comes back a little bit to what we talked previously about, which was um, getting to into the routine of creating something. So Stephen is doing his, um, his morning essentials where he just draw and stuff out, which comes out of his mind. And I think that's something which is, really good and that also um, works hand in hand with something I like to do which is automatic drawing so basically I just take a pen take paper and then I just start doodling without thinking to emptying uh, to empty your mind and that's something I heard that Mobius did um, a lot um, in the beginning to just empty your mind because when you think too much about everything you have maybe problems to get creative in at first so um, that's something I can recommend is just if you have problems to, to um, get something on paper, just take a second piece of paper and take just a pen and start to doodle um, without thinking, just shapes or forms, or whatever it is. And then at some point, the spark will come. And it's also something about your, I think, emotional point, you know? Um, I, I think it's it's you have to bring yourself into that mood of creativity. Maybe also um, look at some images before or um, do your doodle and then think about, okay, what do I like to get inspired of? Maybe look at some nice Pinterest images and um, if you want to do, do um, if you want to do fantasy or if it if it's sci-fi, just maybe look at some images, not with the intention to copy anything, just to get inspired. Or go for YouTube. I mean, uh, it's also possible to, um, if you have someone like, like I also said, I like to watch Steven's videos where he sketched or Ahmed's latest video is also pretty nice where he did his sketchbook videos. Um, I immediately, immediately wanted to sketch faces after I watched the video. So um, that's something you can get inspired on and maybe bring the spark. And when it comes to ideas, um, if you really want to do something, I always can recommend keywords, writing down at least three keywords, Google them to see what comes out, can be, can be completely random, and then maybe something sparks. How's it for you, Stephen? Uh, yeah, really a lot of that, especially the, um, the automatic drawing stuff. Like um, m m when I'm drawing for myself in the mornings, it's mostly completely automatic, you know? It just so happens that um, even when I'm going automatic, you, you wind up doing what you like. You wind up doing sort of your thing. So it's not like it's going to wind up like, it's not always going to wind up abstract or something like that. It, stuff pretty quickly turns into figures and ideas and scenes and things like that. So mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a lot of room there. I mean, I know me personally, I'm more, at this point, I'm more connected with the intuitive side of those things. So I prefer to just search, 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 uh, just very open-minded until I find something. But um, yeah, it, it, it depends on your personality type. It depends on your temperament. And um, you it often, for most people, it helps to really know what your goal actually is, you know, like write it down, have an honest conversation with yourself or others, and just like have a goal. Like, That doesn't mean that it can never change, right? That doesn't mean that like you're, you know, you're not a, a committed or diligent person if you change your goal later. But really knowing your goal in a way that you can like put into words 
is uh, we'll sort of narrow the field and give you a, a set of things to work on and a thing to draw. So th that if you haven't done that, if you don't feel like you have that, I can highly recommend that because a lot of people, um, a lot of people think they know their goal because they feel like they're moving towards a direction. But if you actually sit them down and you're like, what's your goal with all this? If you actually interrogate them on it, they have no idea. They have no idea, right? Uh, some people can only get to like, um, like uh, I want to be an illustrator or I want to be a concept artist. And then if you kind of push that point and you're like, all right, what is that? What does that really mean? You know, um, and uh, that, okay, so that's your goal operationally what do you think that means, right? What are the skills? What are the requirements? They don't know that, you know, they haven't really codified that at least for themselves, right? So I think a lot of people can think that they have a really clear goal in mind, but yeah, if you actually interrogate it, it's a little bit more um, wishy-washy than you think. And um, it can get, you know, it, it's kind of weird because, you know, if, if you're avoiding looking at that, it, it, it seems it's often like, um, Maybe you're afraid to admit, admit to yourself what you really need to learn to um, get that goal. And maybe you don't want to look at that because you already kind of have a feeling like, oh, I need to be really good at color to do that. And uh, I don't really like color or care about color, you know? So you just kind of like pack that away in a box somewhere and you don't ever really want to look at it. Like mm. stuff like that happens all the time, but um, mm. it's worth your time to investigate it early, you know? Yeah. Word, I completely um, agree on that. Also, like at this point of um, being honest to yourself and try to to um, understand what do you need to work on. I mean, sometimes, I, I mean, self reflection is something you learn over your whole life um, to understand yourself and your how to really reflect yourself. Um, but I think that's also what is a mentorship program is good for. If you have a professional who um, got the experience. And the knowledge um, who can help you and immediately understand um, what is your weak point and can tell you, okay, you have to work on perspective, you have to work on anatomy, you have to work on storytelling. That's something which is, I think, is really, really crucial to that. Um, Magdalena also said, Stephen is a great teacher indeed. Um, Melanie said, Haha, <laughs> yes, the power of em empathy while watching other artists. And there's a question to you from Johannes. Did you go to art school and how was it? Yes, I went to an art center college of design in Pasadena, California. And it was by turns miserable, ecstatic, and sublime. It was every it was everything at some point in the <laughs> What an answer. <laughs> so, it's a little hard to pin down. Yeah. I met, a, I met a lot of amazing people. I learned a lot of crazy stuff. I went down many dead ends and mm. yeah, you know, it was quite a journey. Mm. Also, uh, we we talked also a little bit about it already, Hannes. So um, when we upload the stream, you can uh, watch the beginning of it. Um, we talked a lot about um, Stephen's journey at Art Center, if you're more interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's, I think it's very, I, I think the biggest um, thing to remember as you go through all of this is that everyone's journey seems to wind up being completely different. Um, ev everyone seems to diverge so much and go through their own thing. So um, just to anyone out there who's looking for guidance, trying to figure out how they're going to educate themselves on this, um, you know, feel comfortable trying new things, um, feel comfortable changing your educational uh, choice if it doesn't feel comfortable or if it's not working out for you like art is super super hyper personal and um, it's just unreasonable to expect that everyone is going to learn it in the same way so you need to kind of give yourself you need to be a little forgiving with yourself uh, in fact you know knowing the artist personality you need to be extremely forgiving with yourself and, um, and you need to just kind of let yourself go through it the way that you're going to go through it. And, um, you know, don't, don't do the like beating yourself up thing when you hear that where you're like, right, I need to let myself go through it the way that I'm going to go through it as long as I'm going through it good, as long as I'm going through it well. It's like, no, there's going to be 
really just long, confusing times, difficult times, hardening times, challenging times. And you just need to, at a certain point, you must accept everything that is coming your way. You know, you've got to, the art journey is, it takes a long time. Uh, it demands a lot from you. And the being sort of accepting and open to the way the experience will change and, um, and morph for you is really the only way that you're going to keep your energy high to get through the, the years and years of effort that it takes to uh, get an art career going. So the best thing you can do for yourself today is, uh, you know, give yourself a break, forgive yourself, make your plans calmly, work happily, and just uh, accept whatever comes is very, very important. Absolutely. Burnout is real. Um, Hannah said, thanks, and uh, he's going to watch it later. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, oh, I think we also passed the two hour, two hour mark already. Oh my goodness, jeez. Right. Yeah, you're right. I think it's really, I think we can talk for <laughs> ages. Yeah, about that. yeah I um, think so. But yeah, maybe this is a, that's a long time. Maybe this is a good time to clip it and, you know. Yes, you um, know, next time. maybe, yeah, maybe just do it again. And yeah. uh, then we have something uh, we can talk more about. Um, yeah, so um, if there, there, I saw there's no more question. Um, so first of all, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, please make sure to follow Stephen on his YouTube and on his Instagram. I put everything in the video description below. Um, also, um, make sure to check out his uh, mentorship program. It was asked a lot and mentioned a lot. Um, he's a really good teacher, so check that out. Um, otherwise, also make sure to follow me and like the video. And uh, we wish you guys a lot of positive energy. Um, have fun drawing and painting. Um, is there anything you want to add, Stephen? Uh, no, I think you basically covered it. Thanks for having me on. This is great. And uh, I look forward to watching you grow and watching your channel grow. This is awesome. My pleasure. Um, likewise. And uh, um, yeah, let's do that again very soon. Thanks, man. So um, thanks, guys. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, guys. Bye,